Good evening. Welcome. My name is Hisa Kuriyama. I'm the faculty director for the humanities at uh, the Radcliffe Institute. And it's my great pleasure to welcome you uh, and congratulate you for being here. Uh, this is um, an event in the series of the Roosevelt Poetry Readings, which is an endowed event at the Radcliffe Institute. Um, and an event which brings poets of recognized stature uh, to, the, to, to Harvard. Um, it's an event that was endowed by a Radcliffe alumna who was herself a poet. And in past years, uh, we've basically featured one um, major poet. Um, but this year, you're, you're in luck. We have four wonderful poets um, and giving you poetry not only in English, but also in French and Italian as well. Um, it's an event, I, I don't know how many of you were here last evening or any, a few of you. So a few of you got a treat, for foretaste of, uh, of today's event. Um, but it's, today's event is uh, one which is uh, sponsored in collaboration with the fellowship program at uh, the Radcliffe Institute. And along with a wonderful event which occurred last evening, uh, which featured our poets, uh, some, some, also, some recorded poets, and uh, a wonderful musical performance from a, a genius composer from whom you'll, you'll hear uh, in just a few moments. Um, and one of the, the, the themes of uh, both today's event, as you can see, and, and of the concert last night was uh, the theme of rootedness, the exploration of the theme of home, of loss, discovery, finding connections, um, and all of which are related to uh, one of the major themes of uh, the Radcliffe at present, which is the theme of citizenship and belonging. So uh, this evening we have uh, four wonderful poets, and I'm, I'm going to just briefly introduce our biographies um, in the order in which they'll be speaking. Our, our first um, speaker will be, or leader, reciter, will be Elisa Biagini, who lives in Florence after having taught and studied in the United States for several years. Her poems have been published in Italian and American, um, American reviews and, and anthologies. And she has published seven poetry collections, some bilingual, including, I'm sorry, my Italian is non-existent, Los Pite, uh, Fiato, para Parole per Musica, Nel Bosco, uh, Da Una Crepa, and The Guest in the Wood. Her poems have been translated into uh, many languages, and she teaches at NYU Florence. Our second poet is from Jamaica, Shara McCollum, is, and she's the author of five books of poetry, including Mad Woman, which won the uh, 2018 OCM Bocas Prize for Caribbean Poetry, and the 2018 Sheila Margaret Moten Book Prize. Her work has been translated into several languages and has led to a Winter Winter Binner Fellowship. I should know this. this would have been her, um, from the US Library of Congress and a poetry fellowship from the National Endowment for the Arts. Um, Shara McCollum is an English professor at Penn State. Our third poet is Irene Gairou, who was born in Set, France, <laughs> France, sorry, in 1984. Wow, okay. And has published three books of poetry, A Distance de Souffle, uh, Volt, and Pwando. She has two books forthcoming, the poetry collection Tefra, and her first novel, Le Livre uh, des Incompris, which I, title is so great, I really want to read this. Um, her study of music has led her to explore and experience the relationship between music and poetry, and to collaborate with several composers, 
She's an assistant professor of comparative literature at the Sorbonne. And our fourth poet, poet yes, um, is uh, Evie Shockley, who's the author of Semi-Automatic, which was the finalist, or a finalist, for the Pulitzer Prize and the LA Times Book Prize, and winner of the 2018 Hurston Wright Legacy Award. She has published four other collections of poetry, including The New Black, which won the Hurston Wright Legacy Award in 2012, A Critical Study, Renegade, Renegade Politics, Black Aesthetics, and Formal Innovation in African American Poetry. And her honors in also include the 2015 Stephen Henderson Award and the 2012 Holmes National Poetry Prize. And she's spending uh, this academic year as a fellow here at the Radcliffe Institute for Advanced Study. Um, and she normally teaches as professor of English at Rutgers University, um, New Brunswick. So uh, at this point, I'd like to uh, welcome uh, the genius composer from last year's, last, last evening's concert, uh, Marta Gentilucci. One of the things that you'll notice for, for about all these, um, these poems, that I think these poets, um, and I think that was very much in evidence uh, last evening, is that in addition to speaking to this theme, uh, is that they all share this, this wonderful musicality. And uh, so that even if you don't understand Italian, or even if you don't understand, I think you'll be able to understand a lot by the sheer language, or the sheer communicative power of, of the music. Um, so with that, I'd like to turn it over to Marta Gentilucci. Thank you. So I would pass on the genius, but I, I am a composer, so thank you. And I would like to say a couple of words about my research here at Radcliffe because I'm fellow here, and uh, my work. So that is the composition of a canzoniere, a song cycle. So looking at the political and social events of the recent years, years of many changes and displacement of people all over the globe, I needed to re-examine to question my own sense of belonging, my own roots as a person and as a composer, a female composer. Then for me, the most direct way to navigate these social changes and these questions has been to start from and take to the simple and at the same time complex fact that I am a woman and a composer. So my research is very personal, and at the same time, I hope it's not just about me. Central to the song cycle, together with several elements of my musical research and my recent work on the voice, is the exploration of the feminine universe many facets. The focus is on the experience of the world seen and perceived by the female body. That is one of the reasons why I decided to work with female living poets. I wanted to interact with the creation of the text. I want to be fully connected with the voices and with the eyes of the present time, even when it is uncomfortable, partially understood or digested. In the past month then, I have been finding and collecting material that tells stories of other women and their songs. This heterogeneous corpus of text will be a part of my compositions in the way they will be, I would say, my musical roots. And the song will be presented as an independent sense of pieces, but in the future they will be performed as an entire song cycle. One specific encounter here at Radcliffe had been the turning point for my project. Ivy Shockley, also a Radcliffe Fellow this year. The discussion we had and their, her generosity opened a new, new horizons. She introduced me to other American female poets who she believed could bring an important contribution to my project on roots and belonging. And they have greatly. And one of them is here, the Shara McCallum. Tonight, here, there is also the Italian poet, Elisa Virgini, and in a way, she's also a root for me because our work together began almost, I think, 10 years ago. 
And there is also the new road, Irène Guerreau, uh, so French composer, a new encounter, and in a way it's connected to my new home, France. And to conclude, I really would like to say a special thanks to Shana Dolan. So I did it yesterday, and I want to do it also today because he, he has been really precious, because it's thanks to him that today, he, he made it possible today four of the poets that I'm, I'm working with are here. And his curiosity, openness, his listening to my musical ideas, his vision and trust have been an invaluable contribution to Marisette. So thank you very much, Sean, and enjoy the evening. So, and we will start with Elisa Virginie. Okay, I have a very old-fashioned thing to tell me where I'm supposed to stop. And I wanna, thanks for being here, and thank you for having me here. It's such a, an honor to be here. And uh, to read Under a Tree, something that I really like. It'd be fun, uh, you know, if you had a different weather to actually do it outside, but not now, not at all, traumatic enough. So uh, yesterday, whoever was here listened to some fragments from this series that I wrote recently, will be published in Italy next year, and in the US in a Raritan journal as well next year, of this um, alternating current that's from Mary Shelley's diary. You heard the Italian yesterday, so what else? you have some handouts there. You have the English, but I want to read some of the fragments in English, and then a couple of poems, short poems in Italian, so that you get both the... Yesterday was very much about sound. Today is about sound, but, you know, meaning imagery uh, as well. So in this uh, book, um, we, uh, I, I kind of investigate the nature of electricity, and there are different characters, and one is Mary Shelley. You all know the story, so I don't have to tell. That's a great thing about, you know, referring to such huge figures. And the idea was this. Mary Wollstonecraft died after giving birth to Mary Shelley. Why not regenerate who generated you? So the fragments of alternating current from Mary Shelley's diary are about her, you know, figuring out the way how to bring her mother back to life. So forget about all these men doing things, you know, a doctor making a man figure. No, it's actually her saying, wait a second, I've learned a lot, let me try this out. So I will read a few fragments from this as if they were taken from the pages of her diary. You will excuse my accent, you have to deal with that. <laughs> a lightning bolt, a contraction, Bullet like rain has been battering us for days. The treetops converge to many electrons here. Your memory fumes, engulfs like fog to windows. At the table for hours, there is a sort of tremor of plates around my wrist. My sleeve is a curtain for the blood. Outside, the color is winter unleashed. You come back between clouds and turf. It is dark like inside of a crater as you rise up, a shadow from my throat. And on the threshold of my leap, you acquire weight, fall onto the center of the page, open up. The winds and the voices, wasps in a jar, the others crowd around by the want ear and table uncluttered for our encounter. We are birds fleeing the cold by heading north where the wind carries away saliva and syllables. We have made it here to this glass numbed by breath. I've seen frogs, tissue, a head come back to life. Where is the electric tongue that gives voice and gaze to your melancholic flesh? In this white darkness, I've gathered dirt in my pockets, electrons under my fingernails. You grow larger, embrace the roots at my ears. To be here is to step on our own shadows. Even if far off, I see the lava under the clouds of earth. It has the color of cloud that reflects the gaze of a knife between two pages. My eye listens to the morning fingernail, and in this nest of nerves, the wind that wakes me is the color of a rubber stalk, 
slow is putting one foot in front of the other. A night in the forest of neurons, it resounds like solar flares on the surface of the sun. My synapses sizzle as they were thin. Now they are so thin that they allow me a seeing as silent as a bone, a finding you in the cold glass of the mirror. Water stays descended without touching, leaves counted without seeing the trees, glasses clean with carbon paper, words shaken off my sleeves. The sky is black and blue as I gather up the pieces for your return, shipment to a foreign country. Your breath has been kept in a vase in expectation. From the blurry threshold, you come closer, you up to now without the world. The shadows are useless, the light is space without walls. What wavel rises up to my mind when I graze the tendon, the bone of your finger, the snow on the windowsill? The path is made of husks, fire, bread, milk. There are words left in the fire. The suitors are braille, eyes the distance between my memory and your breath. Two more poems, because I want to take space the other. Uh, this one is from this collection, The West uh, in the Wood. Um, they came out in 2013. I read both the Italian and the English, very short poems. Mi mostri le ferite da soldato, la tua battaglia contro un'altra te che ti consuma negli occhi, nelle ossa, nella pelle, che ha tagliato i tuoi tendini da tempo, il filo tutto intero che ti tiene palombare o che più non risale. You show me your wounds like a soldier, your battle against another you consuming your eyes, bones, skin, who cut your tendons a while ago, the cord that holds you, diver who want resurface. And today I had the pleasure to see Emily Dickinson's room. I'm quite a fanatic. And uh, I, and the last collection came out in the US um, a couple of years ago. One section is uh, dedicated uh, to Emily and is now kind of a member of the family, sort of like, you know, grand grandmother or something like that. I quite. Actually, the book in the first section is about Paul Ceylan, and I read some fragments yesterday. The central section is about my grandfather, the third about Emily Dickinson, so it is indeed part of the family at this point. And this section is called Coi denti macchiati d'inchiostro, with ink-stained feet photographs, dialogue with Emily Dickinson. I basically imagine myself uh, seated at, in a corner in her room in Amherst, uh, even though the real stuff is here at Harvard, you know that, uh, the table and the chair and all the little objects, um, and kind of observing what, what she was doing. But I, when I was done with this section, actually, I thought, I love these two people so much, Paulson and Emily Dick, so what about having them meet? Something that, obviously, given they were born in completely different times, but who cares? That's my book, so I do what I want, and therefore, I have them meet. So the title is actually in English also, the Italian poem is Impatient of the Fewest Words, and it's taken from a letter that um, Susan, uh, you know, the, the, everybody knows who Susan is in the life of Emily Dickinson, I have to say, and sent to Emily saying, you are impatient of fewest words, and that really belongs also to me as well. In piedi, sulla soglia, il mio occhio nella tua mano, la tua lingua sul mio orecchio, così ci conosciamo, toccandoci, perché la pupilla è sgranata per lo sforzo, le papille come scarta vetrate. Se l'asse cede, Se la voce affonda c'è qui, nell'aria, la parola ramo che ci tiene. Standing on the threshold, my eye in your hand, your tongue on my ear, so we know one another by touching each other. Because my eye is grainy from the strain, your tongue as though sandpapered. If the board gives way, if the voice founders, 
right here in the air is the word branch that holds us up. Thank you. Good afternoon. Um, I'm really honored, thankful to be here reading with these wonderful poets. Marta, thank you for bringing us all together. And thanks to everybody, Sean and everyone at the Radcliffe Institute for making this possible. I'm gonna read five poems and I'm not gonna say anything about them because we're gonna have this great chance to have a conversation afterward. Other than that, I hope they speak to this theme. Um, I'll begin with a poem from the place of my birth, which I've just come back from, actually, right before coming here. Psalm for Kingston. If I forget thee, O Jerusalem. Psalm 137. City of Jack Mandora, Minna choose none. Of Anansi prevailing over mongoose, brother rat, puss, and dog. Anansi. Saved by his wits in the midst of chaos and against all odds. Of body big boy stories told by peacock strutting boys. Hush, hush, but loud enough to be heard by everyone passing by the yard. City of market women at halfway tree with baskets atop their heads and planted in front of their laps. Squatting or standing with arms akimbo, susuing with one another, clucking their tongues, calling in voices of pure sugar. Come, Dudu, see the pretty bag I have for you. Then kissing their teeth when you saunter off. City of school children in uniforms playing dandy shandy and brown girl in the ring. Tra la 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 eating bun and cheese and bulla and mango, juice sticky and running down their chins, bodies arced in laughter, mouths agape, heads thrown back. City of old men with roomy eyes, crouched in doorways on verandas, paring knives in hand, carving wood pipes or peeling sugar cane, of younger men pushing carts of oranges and roasted peanuts, calling out as they walk the streets and night draws near, of coconut vendors with machete in hand. City where power cuts left everyone in sudden dark, where the kerosene lamp's blue flame wavered on kitchen walls, where empty bellies could not be filled where no eggs, no milk, no beef today echoed in shanty towns, around corners, down alleyways. City where Marley sang, Ja would never give the power to a bald head, while the bald heads reigned. Where my parents chanted down Babylon, fire, bun, Ja, Rastafari Selassie, I, where they paid weekly Jews, saving for our passages back to Africa, while in their beds, my grandparents slept fitfully, dreaming of America. City that lives under a long memoried sun, where the gunmen of my childhood are today's dons, ruling neighborhoods as fiefdoms, where violence and beauty still lie down together. City of my birth, if I forget thee, who will I be singing the Lord's song in this strange land? Dear History, I could tell when my parents stopped believing. Marcus, Marley, Manly, their gods deserted them. 
leaving little to ring between their hands. After a time, revolutions light, dims. Ideals get exchanged for smaller needs, milk and bread, the crumbs of peace. In the final days, everyone tried to explain what had gone wrong. Politicians said, tourists would no longer come. Mommy and daddy said slavery was the root. Granny said it was the ute, killing each other, running wild in the streets. The night before she and Papa left for America, I prayed in the dark of my room, but feared my words could no longer spiral up to something beyond. We will come back for you, I promise, they'd said. When piece by piece my family fled, we didn't see the bargain being struck to live in a place where memory becomes a synonym for home. Memory. I bruise the way the most secreted, most tender part of a thigh exposed, purples, then blues. No spit shine shoes, I'm dirt. You can't wash from your feet. Wherever you go, know I'm the wind, accosting the trees, the howling night of your sea. Try to leave me. I'll pin you between a rock and a hard place. We'll hunt you, even as you erase your tracks with the tail ends of your skirt. You think I'm gristle, begging to be chewed? No, my love, I'm bone. Rather, the sound bone makes when it snaps. That ditty lingering in you like ruin. Lucy Jamaica at the Hanover Infirmary, 1996. What I saw there, I could not carry. She had lifted a sheet revealing her abscess. I was a young woman then, traveling towards some notion of home. But a sheet had been lifted, an abscess revealed. I'd hoped I might meet myself, traveled home with some notion of finding the girl I was in braids. I'd hoped to meet this younger self on a coastal road bridging towns. But another girl with braided hair waved each morning I arrived. A crossroad between tourist towns, Lucy is a place you could miss. Arriving each morning, I thought if I looked enough, I'd find not an idea, but the place itself. Coming to a part of my country I didn't know, I looked long to find liquid pools in opened flesh. Coming to a country I thought I knew, a young woman, liquid and open fleshed. I saw there what I could not carry. And this is the last poem I will read, which is um, in honor of Marta, who also once was a singer as I.
she. She could sing the blue out of water. She could sing the meat off a bone. She could sing the fire out of burning. She could sing a body out of home. She could sing the eye out of a hurricane. She could sing the fox right out its hole. She could sing the devil from the details. She could sing the lonely from a soul. She could sing a lesson in a yardstick. She could sing the duppy out of night. She could sing the shoeless out of homesick. She could sing a wrong out of a right. She could sing the prickle from the nettle. She could sing the sorrow out of stone. She could sing the tender from the bitter. She could sing the never out of gone. Thank you. Bonjour. First of all, I would like to thank Marta and Sean for having me here. It's a great, great pleasure and a great honor too. And then I would also like to thank Cécile Guédon, who is here and who translated the text you have on the handout. And the handout. And uh, she did really a huge, huge work to do that, so I, I really thank her for that. I will start with a free verse poem called Le Mince Espace de la Traque, which means something like the narrow hunting trail. Par un chemin de halage transformé, une terre vulcanisée, ses eaux traquées, gibier pris au collet de glace, en pays mouvant, en éclat de safran sur une houle fauve. Lové là, j'entends croître dans l'isolé des terres sans distance. Quelque chose coule de mon waterfront. En hâte, je saisis les armes. Le métal piqué contre ma peau, et l'immobilité du guet, ce n'est pas comme la mer. Je traque le long du jour ourlé près des fenêtres, des traces laissées là, comme entre les broussailles des passés de bêtes. Sous mon front, fougue saline, charroi de terre, lave coulée d'espace, figée. Toujours en slow motion et en teinte de givre, la mer s'entrave les pieds sur le chemin. Je libère un long cri comme on lâche les chiens. Tenu aux abois, dans la trame sonore du dégel, j'écoute se débattre un pays de longue absence. Des frontières sur la mer disjointe, des territoires invisibles, traversent de part en part mon visage à l'affût. Je traduis des lèvres apprises, les traîne comme une proie sur le sentier dans la forêt farouche, vers ma bouche de girofle clouée. Épingler les bouches, Blanche sous la morsure, tombée, rendues avec les armes, est une issue qui s'use. Nos doigts s'étanchent, rouge à rouge, sans saisir jamais la main courant, cherchant les flèches à tâtons sur la terre. J'entends le qui vive d'une présence étroite se tramer à distance de souffle, à la mesure. Il y a Toujours la porte qui dépeuple ou la lisière du bois. Au travers des champs, une ombre disparaît. Longtemps, je scrute et écoute l'air cru. Avant la nuit, je retourne sur mes traces, rebrousser chaque feuille sur le sol criblé où nos corps ont cédé, je rassemble 
les éclats de métal. De nuit, une halte près d'un point d'eau à peine plus grand que la mer, adossée à un tronc dévoré d'insectes, je repose mon verre sur la table et je lèche ma blessure à bout de fièvre. Les rayons à l'orée du jour lacèrent le sous-bois de lumière. Ils acclament en silence l'étirement du corps, la peau exhalant sa nuit. Usés par le guet et l'affût et la traque, mes cils cristaux réveillent. Je me coule dans le point d'eau, lave ma blessure à porter avec les armes sur les chemins. La tête sous l'eau, j'entends peu les oiseaux qui décochent leurs cris d'alarme. Revenu là où m'attend le carquois vide, une goutte élit sa trace jusqu'à ma cheville, le long. Je saisis à mes pieds un apôt le garde à mon cou sur un lacet et je passe la porte, sûr de l'instant où, entre les sarments et les pierres, s'ouvriraient les pistes. J'ai marché dans des couloirs sombres, sur des sentiers recouverts. Les feuilles noires étouffaient la terre, je n'entendais plus le bruit de mes pas. Immobile, je guette le mouvement des feuilles. Le corps ramassé comme avant de bondir, j'occupe la bordure du chemin, garde en mémoire le point d'eau, la goutte, longtemps. Vient sur moi le poil vivant des fauves, viennent des nuits, des craquements, des calmes. Alors, un matin, la forêt repousse ses lisières, élargit l'espace. J'aperçois, entre les troncs d'un jardin infini, un geste lumineux qui m'arme, me désarme. And then I would like to read four very short prose poems uh, that are very different. You will see it's, kind, it's between prose poetry and flash fiction or flash poetical fiction in a way. And they are also translated by Ceci. Enfin, il ose revenir à l'ancien appartement. Au centre de la pièce, sur le parquet de bois, repose un grand cadre éblouissant. Il reconnaît le miroir. Il s'approche pour la première fois d'un pas calme et commence à marcher sur le cristal impassible. Il atteint le bord du miroir où la lumière se multiplie et contemple le précipice. À l'aube, il découvrir son corps diffracté. Enfermée dans sa maison, elle regarde par la baie vitrée les taillis se tordre sous les rafales. Sa main se crispe autour d'un verre où fondent quelques glaçons. Quand elle ouvre la verrière et s'avance dans le jardin, le grand vent se rue sur elle, l'enveloppe, l'assiège. Chaque passage de l'air sur sa peau affine peu à peu son corps, comme un vase minci entre les mains insistantes du potier. Sa taille entourée de souffle devient aussi frêle qu'une branche. Ses bras tendus s'amenuisent et s'effacent, son visage s'émousse autour de ses lèvres disparues dans un cri. D'entre les doigts du vent, s'envolent quelques grains de sable. Certains soirs, depuis qu'elle habitait dans son nouvel appartement, elle percevait, à peine allongée dans le noir, un bruit d'eau qui s'écoulait, comme si un ruisseau était apparu soudain devant sa porte. Quelquefois, elle se relevait pour vérifier si aucun filet d'eau ne s'échappait des robinets ou du pommeau de douche. Mais le son s'effaçait dès qu'elle se mettait debout pour reprendre aussitôt qu'elle se recouchait. Tandis que le sommeil l'emportait peu à peu, elle écoutait l'eau couler à l'intérieur d'elle-même, prendre source dans sa gorge, dévaler le long de sa trachée, puis sombrer plus bas 
beaucoup plus bas, avec des clapotements sourds résonnant sur les parois d'une caverne sous-marine. La chaleur de l'après-midi était sèche, suffocante. Dans sa torpeur, il ne distinguait plus que de vagues plaques de soleil qui flottaient sur la terrasse et dont la réverbération lui embrasait les pupilles. Presque inconsciemment, il plongea dans la piscine. La fraîcheur de l'eau fut comme un frisson électrique qu'il prolongea en délassant son corps au fond du bassin. Soudain, il perçut à travers ses paupières closes un brusque assombrissement de la lumière. Depuis des jours, on n'avait pas vu un nuage. Il ouvrit les yeux sous l'eau. Des guêpes, par essaim entier, recouvraient toute la surface de la piscine et formaient un couvercle strié jaune et noir. Les poumons brûlants, prêts d'éclater, il fut pris de panique. Puis, tout s'apaisa. Il pouvait maintenant respirer sous l'eau. Thank you. Merci. Oh, good afternoon, evening. Um, I'm so delighted to be here. I want to just echo the thanks to Marta, the appreciation of my uh, fellow or sister poets, um, and um, thanks to Sean and Hisa for making this space available to us and the hospitality. Thank you all for coming. I am going to read um, three poems and um, Two of them are from my second book, The New Black, um, which was a lot for me about um, belonging and those kinds of issues. And this first poem is from that collection. It is called My Life as China. I was imported. I was soft in the hills where they found me, shining in a private dark. I absorbed fire and became fact. I was fragile. I incorporated burnt cattle bones, powdered remains, ashes to ashes. I was baptized in heat, fed on destruction. I was not destroyer, was not destroyed. I vitrified. None of me was the same. I was many. How can I say this? I was domesticated, trusted, treasured. I was translucent, but not clear. Put me to your lips. I will not give. I will give you what you have given me. This next poem is much, much newer, more recent. Um, I spent a semester in Paris um, a couple of years ago now. And um, I love that city very much. Um, but I found myself, as I think many of us do, looking for um, a way to feel at home in a place where I was spending nearly six months. Um, this poem was inspired in part by that search, you might say, and um, by some of the work of Cy Twombly, an American-born um, artist whose work was being exhibited at Centre Pompidou um, that spring. So there, there are three sections to the poem. And each section is titled after one of uh, Twombly's paintings. Expatria, 50 days at Ilium, shield of Achilles. A mythology begins with a question, like who are we? Where are we? What is red? Why paint? Why me, Lord, why? A person who knows 
All the answers can only borrow a mythology, like I'm King Midas or I'm God. A painter can take a mythology and remake it so that it answers a new question, like Romer Bearden asking Odysseus, who are my we? And Cy Twombly asking Achilles, why are we still you? Painting the eye of the storm on a shield, cutting the trickster out of black and blue paper and lashing him with glue to the mast of his last ship. The journey always rough, some miserable god under land, under sea, always looking for company, people always succumbing. The hero is the one who comes home, even if it's by process of elimination. A playwright can make a mythology ask, what's wrong with this song? Like Susan Laurie Parks asking Ulysses about coming home from the war. So why are you a hero? And why are you still coming home from a war? And women die in wars too, even if it's not the expected death. And wait, that's not a question. But it's still a mythology if that's the only thing she knows for sure. Quattro stagioni, primavera, estate, autunno, inverno. A mythology can ask, why is autumn so beautiful? And why is winter, blight-stricken as it is, so arresting? A mythology, as opposed to a young person, can find autumn and winter much more striking than summer. Sun-bleached summer, so legibly the scene of happiness that nothing else can really happen there. A mythology can see the blood in spring, the stages of growth, a kind of violence the body does to itself. It will never be this way again, and yet it can't get on to the next moment fast enough. A mythology can ask, why does spring throw its arms out with abandon, even when it's abandoning itself? A mythology can ask, why is winter so much greener than spring, even clouded in white? The icicles trail as far down the evergreens as they can, but they don't keep the wind from brushing snow and sun across the mountain on the same day. The inferno is always burning, men and women, women going up in flames. A poet can ask, why do daughters grow up by going down? Like Rita Dove asking Persephone, you think he's hot? All the while, autumn is answering the question about gorgeous rotting, just magenta, green, brown, pink, yellow, red, violet, flying off the mythological canvas. Untitled, a gathering of time. A mythology of time can ask a subtle question. A sky blue can gather white clouds right before your eyes, holding them by threads of paint, stringing us along so that we miss the purple. The thunder is always farther away than the whitening. A poet can grab a mythology of time that takes place over the dead bodies of letter after letter. The tongue lays them to rest, and they cover are covered by a sheet that falls far from the tree. A Cy Twombly can leave for Rome at 29 and still die an American artist, a hero who doesn't come home. A photographer can snag a mythology to turn her back on it, wearing black and steady gazing from a question that's a statement of the only thing she knows for sure. Like Carrie Mae Weems asking institutions like the British Museum when and where I enter showing that she's the answer. Contrast, stark, the steps leading in, leading away, bright but heavy. The poet can ask a mythology a question like, what is black in the museums of Paris? And again, the mythology pierces the clouds. It thunders so loud, but so late, that by then we've forgotten we saw the lightning, we saw the lightning, we saw it, and it was not subtle. 
And I will close with another poem from um, The New Black that is in the form called a guzzle. It's so directly related to the theme of our event that I won't say anything about the content of the poem, but you should know that the form, the, the guzzle, is um, an ancient Persian form. Um, it's written in couplets, and what connects the couplets is a repeating refrain at the end of each couplet. The first line of the poem tells you what the refrain is going to be, and you're, it locks in at the end of the second line. And so after that, the end of every couplet, you know what's coming. Now, the ancient Persian crowds, and I do mean crowds, who would come to poetry readings, um, would figure out the refrain and sh you know, sort of shout it along or say it along with the poet at the end of um, the refrain. I don't know if this audience is up to that standard, but the form invites it, I will just say. It's called Where You Are Planted. He's high as a Georgia pine, my father'd say, half laughing. Southern trees as measure, metaphor. Highways lined with kudzu-covered southern trees. Fuchsia, lavender, white, light pink, purple. Crepe myrtle bouquets burst open on sturdy branches of skin-smooth bark. My favorite, southern trees. 100 degrees in the shade, we settle into still pools of humidity, moss dark beneath live oaks. Southern heat makes us grateful for southern trees. The maples in our front yard flew in spring on helicopter wings. In fall, we splashed in colored leaves, but never sought sap from these southern trees. Frankly, my dear, that's a magnolia, I tell her, <laughs> fingering the deep green, nearly plastic leaves, amazed how little a northern girl knows about southern trees. I've never forgotten the charred bitter fruit of holidays poplars, nor will I. It's part of what makes me Evie. I grew up in the shadow of Southern Trees. Thank you. Um, so this is just the beginning. Uh, I'm sure that we'll all read these. I, I know that I will read all these wonderful poets. Um, but also read them with a, with a new ear. Um, having actually heard the voices, I think really helps us to appreciate the, the written word in, with, with new resonances. So we have a, we're going to have a panel uh, uh, discussion with our poets uh, led by Professor Lisa New, um, who is uh, Paul M. Cabot Professor of American Literature at, here at Harvard where she teaches courses in American literature from the Puritans through uh, the present day. Uh, Professor New is uh, author of many books, uh, starting from The Regenerate Lyric, Theology and Innovation of American Poetry, uh, to, more recent, to more recently, uh, New England Beyond Criticism, in Defense of America's First Literature. Um, but she's also um, active in many other ways in in disseminating appreciation of poetry. She's the creator and host of Poetry in America and the director of Verse Video Education. Since 2013, uh, she has been producing educational materials on American poetry for tens of thousands of global learners of all ages. Uh, new created Poetry in America, a public television series and educational initiative um, to encourage engagement with American poetry beyond academic audiences. Uh, guest interpreters have included Shaquille O'Neal, Bono, Cynthia Nixon, Joe Biden, Herbie Hancock, Elena Kagan, Robert Pinsky, Sonia Sanchez, Bill Clinton, John McCain, Lee Jung Lee, Samantha Power, 
exonerated prisoners, clergy members, pick up basketball players, uh, young campers at Wildlife Preserve, and many more. So uh, with that, I'd like to welcome Professor uh, New and our wonderful poets. Thank you all for um, that beautiful, stimulating, rich set of readings, um, readings that indeed, as I heard your voices and the music in your voices, um, I found myself trying to alter the question I came in with, having, having just read you. But I, I think I'll, I'll see if you alter it uh, for me. What, I found remarkable about the four of you as poets is that it seemed like you'd been kind of conferring, <laughs> that you had some of the same things in mind. Um, and we can talk in a, in a moment about, about if that's so or why that might be. Is it our historical moment? Is it, what is, what is it? But I think the, the question, it feels to me that all of your poems allow us to think about is who is an I? <laughs> what, is, what is an I? And who, who is this voice that travels between places and may or may not have an identity or a coherence? There's a there's a question that I found myself asking with this, with this theme in mind that had to do with whether rootedness is the same as wholeness, right? We, uh, and in all of your poems, there was a, a, um, a tendency for things to blow to smithereens, <laughs> as we would say, right? To, to, to fragment like parts of a Frankenstein monster or like, like a child detaching from its mother. And um, uh, so I've just thrown some smithereens uh, out there. And, and so here's, here's a question, and maybe you could begin to talk among yourselves and with all of us with lines of, of your own or each other's in mind. And the question is, where is, is wholeness or rootedness or integrity even a value <laughs> that, um, that you and your own, each of your poetic practices are, are working toward? Um, is it seems like a, there's a story of separation, uh, of separation that's being told as, with as much um, intention and passion as a story of rootedness. And I'm wondering, and I'm going like this, but not like this. <laughs> uh, but this this relationship of of in, of the integral and the put together to the rooted and maybe physical place is one that I'm feeling all of you as poets um, raising for us without being too pedantic about this issue. It's a shame to use a word like issue after all the music we've heard. Yes, would you? Sure, I, could, I, sh I can begin. Um, I love what, thank you for that question and for your work for poetry, by the way. Um, I, I like the idea that um, rootedness and wholeness are not the same. And that's at least partly coming out of my own experience of it, which is I have a great longing for rootedness. And at the same time, it's a dishonest one for me personally. And I've seen that from early in my life, that fracturing of cells has been so apparent for me and made apparent to me by forces such as migration. Um, I was even introduced tonight, thank you for your introduction, as a Jamaican poet and then an American poet. And those are both true. 
and they also are not always, um, they do not always make me feel whole. So I will just start there and say, you know, there's a lot of reasons for it in my autobiography, but then that's made me really interested in this question of the self and the I and how we are trying to make cohere something that is at times for each of us, mine are personal to my racial identity, you know, my, my immigration and national identity. But I think that's the sort of position many of us face that this I is something we're constantly trying to make whole and also, if we're honest, recognizing its disintegration and um, its, its propensity for plurality. And so I think that tension for me is what is most interesting in art to explore. In life, you know, I do have to do grocery shopping, so <laughs> I do have to be a, a person who pushes a cart. But in the poem, I like to, I like to expose the fragments and the ruptures, and, and that's interesting to me. In the search for wholeness at the and, same time. You know, when you say so. pushing a cart, yes. that so many of these poems are also in motion. Right, and in, in motion and in motions that aren't necessarily simply the motion away from a lost home, but you know, might be other other kinds of motion. I'm thinking about a narrow oh, yeah, yeah. <laughs> a I narrow mean. trail and a mythological heroine or sufferer of of some kind who makes her way along. Yeah, exactly. For me, how to be rooted in the word go through movement, like uh, the body is moving, uh, following a track or something. Mm -hmm. And I totally agree with this idea of tension, because for me, what I seek is to participate in a way in the world, to be rooted in the world, and there is big tension between nature and very contemporary and everyday life world. That's why I'm looking for images that are can be like raw and mythological and this kind of images, but mixed all the time with very contemporary and everyday life images. That's why, for example, in the poem I read, there is this image of uh, a woman who is just sitting on a tree trunk eaten by insects, and at the same time she's just, she's just putting her glass on the table. So at the same time, she's in the forest, in very archaic uh, place, and at, and at the same time, she's in a home mm -hmm. using very everyday life mm -hmm. objects. And for me, this contract, this, this tension in, is a way to be participating in the world in a more complete way, or I would say. Where motion with motion, every time there is movements. Like I, I, I get up, I sit, I play and something. And women don't get to be the movers. You know, traditionally that. I mean, you you give us a mythological heroine with the weapons. And yeah, exactly. <laughs> but she's it, also there is also contrast here because she's wearing weapons, but at the same time she's wounded. Yes. Yeah, so. It's more complicated than just wearing weapons and being offensive. She will never use these weapons. She will just, at some point, leave them. In another poem, she leaves them on the soil, and they just mixed with the soil, and it's a way to be participating in the world also. Mm. So she's wounded, and she's wearing weapons. It's kind of contrast. Mm. Mm. And you too, Evie, are, we're coming back. Um, <laughs> you too, Evie, are taking us via Cy Twombly um, to the mythological. <laughs> yeah, I, I resonate so much with, um, with what Erin was saying about tension and what Shara was saying about plurality. Um, I think that um, my way of trying to create a sense of home in that space uh, of, of being abroad and um, not seeing the things that I'm familiar with as, as even small signs of home, um, was, it was um, to gather and to collect people and to, to see kind of African-American culture as a, as a myth-making practice, in a sense, and that I could participate in that even from, you know, away from home 
a home that's already complicated as my life in China, as China is meant to, to indicate as well. But um, that, that sense of, of being able to, to create something with the fragments and for it to be enough at, at any moment and to have to recreate it at a different moment. It's quite, quite extraordinary thinking about the, that image of the China that is being burnt into its strength, <laughs> right? Vit vitrified, vitrified, is that the, right? Mm -hmm. um, and the way that resonates with Irene's <laughs> description of a, of a weaponed, begirded, uh, heroine who is also um, wounded and borne down uh, and that so we've been talking about tensions and double and doublenesses um, and I was thinking you Elisa it's very rare I get to see, sit with an Elisa who has the exact same spelling <laughs> a, a kinship um, I, I was, as Evie was talking about being in, um, in Paris, I was thinking about you visiting Emily Dickinson's <laughs> house in Amherst and about, um, you both make visits to artists, right? Um, to artists' homes, artists whose own blown to smithereens uh, <laughs> tendencies, um, may resonate with, so could you, would you talk, Elise, a little um, bit maybe about? Yeah, I, I agree also with what Shara was saying about, um, you know, the, the many eyes, you know, kind of like swarming, like bees, and also through time, it's just a matter of space in different many locations. Many eyes, I'm sorry, I, many, many eyes, right? yes, the pronoun eyes, eye. eyes, you're right, you're right. The, the, the eyes specific. swarming like bees were really cool too. <laughs> <laughs> <So>. <laughs> So, okay, uh, okay, those <laughs> Just, absolutely. And, but also true history. So there's the whole idea that mm -hmm. Emily Dickinson and Paul Sinan meet and that I'm there with them. So they're all part of one huge I, capital. <laughs> and I, yeah. and yeah. that is the I made out, the I who goes to make you the poet. Yeah, is, exactly, um, being, being there. And also um, this idea of the verticality, I like it very much, looking for uh, the roots of identity. You have this one, uh, poem, my grandfather, his name was Dante. So obviously if you have, you know, I come from Florence, so you Excellent. have to do with that eventually. And he, he worked in the, he was actually a technician, but he worked in the mine. So the whole idea of going down, looking for the roots. So it came, it wasn't a silver plate that I could not, not write that poem, you know, I had to be written and it's, uh, it's in here. So that was very interesting, but then that's my very specific history, very specific Dante, very specific Elisa, but wait a second, I'm telling also another story. I'm telling a story about looking for specific words. I'm telling a story. So it's not just me. It's just mm -hmm. sharing this uh, with the kind of search that any, every writer does, right, for the, mm -hmm. the precise term. Mm -hmm. Yes, they were talking about something to be precise sound, the precise world. Uh, and also the precise place. I mean, yeah. we, we've been talking about m movement and... Um, disintegral um, motions, but all of your poetries are all of all of your poems that that we heard refer almost anyway refer to particular places, homelands, um, particular kinds of loss that we're certainly aware of today, as the whole world seems to be on the move with its backpack and its flu and its broken bones. Yes. Um, and does, could we talk a little bit more concretely about, about place? Because we've, we've been having a conversation that's about selfhood as it's composing itself and decomposing in a Frankenstein-y kind of, kind of way. And yet there are there are real claims that home <laughs> makes on us uh, for truth telling of various kinds. And yeah, I, I actually am thinking right now about, um, I mean, you mentioned at the beginning, it seemed like we had conferred, which we hadn't. Um, the, the, the confluences come from Marta's project. Mm -hmm. And um, 
I th I'm, you, what your question makes me think about some of our conversations about um, what it means for women specifically to be uprooted or displaced and, and, and the kinds of things that we have at our disposal, um, sometimes gender constrained, but not ever entirely, right? But the, the kinds of things that we have at our disposal to recreate home, um, and one of those things is language. And for me, I mean, the poem of mine that's specifically about where I'm from, um, the South, specifically Tennessee, um, the language in that poetry is as much, you know, the, the, the sayings that we have or the, the, even just the accent that I can't help reading it in um, is so much a part of what defines that place as much as the trees that are the visual markers of place that we mm -hmm. and those accents come from about. outside the self, mm -hmm. right? They are yours, yeah. yours as well, Shara. Absolutely, I couldn't agree more with Evie's comments on how language is a conveyor of place, particularly when you leave a place. And so the things that are idiomatic or the expressions that you continue to hear um, mark you as from a particular geographic space and even a temporal space as you were commenting on because for example in the you know the psalm for Kingston there's a lot of words I would expect you not to know what those words mean um, you know we're reading in English the the two of us here and yet we're reading in particular kinds of Englishes so they are marked by a, a sense of rootedness um, and yeah, I think it's a, it's a fascinating thing to continue to think about how place is actually real to me and also made not real um, in the work. Once you fix it in the poem, and I don't know if Evie or others want to comment on this, it seems to me that, for example, the Jamaica that I am constructing in Psalm for Kingston, that particular Kingston is a Kingston that doesn't quite exist anymore. So when I just, I just came back from Kingston right now, that Kingston is different than the Kingston of this poem. So there's something also that's desirable for me as somebody who lost a homeland to always try to be reconstructing in memory, like remembering the body that, you know, you're putting back together, this place, because I can't go back to it. And with this sort of the cliche, right? Of course, we can't go back, but, but poetry is this bridge and language is this bridge, so. Which is always lost. No, it's Which always is, lost. It's yeah. referent. It's oh my referent. gosh, it's, I sound like a French deconstructionist. No, 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 no. <laughs> it's difficult, <laughs> but it's but it's right. <laughs> difference, right? It's endless, endless, right? Yeah. That's where my French ends. So I look at you now. <laughs> I love. I'm sorry. I'm so I'm so stimulated by this. It's you know we be, I I maybe it's my fault. I began by asking a question about self, but to be using the accents that you get and the language to read to us in French and, and in your English and Italian. We don't get our accents from ourselves. We don't get our languages from ourselves. They come, they come not, and they don't actually come from the ground either. They come from other human beings um, who murmur and shoo shoo. <laughs> Yeah, but that resonate in the body. The body is the place, right? So at least for me, but I hear from them as well. I think the one element that we have in common, obviously Marta picked us for, for a reason, but clearly there is also an historical moment that we're coming in, you know, like the sense that the fragment, I mean, since we're uh, mentioning philosophers, think about Benjamin, right? Mm -hmm. I mean, and the element, the importance of the fragment to I mean, I give you, present the fragment, and I recreate my personal little story around it, but then you with the very same fragment. But the common element, obviously, is the body, the way the language and the sound resonates, and uh, mm -hmm. the need that you have to make sense of the world out there. So the language is that. Uh, and this is, regardless of what we write about, this is really the urgency that mm -hmm. is behind you know, writing these, mm -hmm. and that creates the space place that is the room, the page in the specific mm -hmm. case. Uh, I'm thinking, I'm thinking, yeah. Alisa, about your, yeah, your was, little postage stamp, the, the, right. the sit, <laughs> Alisa's poem, sit on the, on the corner mm -hmm. of the page and the space arcs around them yeah. as if... Absolutely. No, because I want the page to become the room where the writer and the reader meet so that we can share the space here, the silence, so that something new can, can you know. Mm -hmm. 
be created. But that longing and that urgency too is Absolutely. graphically represented yeah. on the page that doesn't, that's just not full. Yeah, exactly. We are, I think it's probably time to open, open up to questions if people have questions. I feel obliged to make a comment because I have been named so many times. I, and I think I, it's incredible for me because I don't use words, I use sounds, but today for the first time I heard all you four, so make me kind of make the, con the implicit connection that I, I made with music, well, you, you made it with words. And so the fact that, so I, I, I see one specific thread that is really dear to me, the fact that movement and fragment, so the movement is the, the way in which you connect the fragments. And so mm. the fragmentation and the centrifugal movement, it doesn't create distraction, but it creates connections. And so I think this is what fascinated me. So also my music is made by fragments, but the need, the urgency, is to create a whole. Mm -hmm. And so what seems to be, so I agree and disagree the fact that rootlessness and whole are not the same, but at the same time, they refer to the same root mm. and they are participating through the movement to the same, to the same thing. So I, I can't, so I'm, I'm not very good with word, but I think it's that. And what fascinated me for all the poems poets that are here is this ability to have this singularity in the voice and I was struck by the fact that for the first time I heard Elisa Biagini saying her poetry in, in English and I didn't recognize her <laughs> because for me I hear what, what Char was saying that there is something about the identity and the identity as Italian as American Jamaican or mm -hmm. Tennessee writer Mm -hmm. or French. So I hear that. Mm -hmm. And I identify the sound with this voice that is not just the meaning of the words, but it's mm -hmm. this identity of the sound that is carried by the voice. Mm -hmm. So it was not a question, it was more like Comments. a comment, but I wanted to, to integrate so the, my experience with you, with you all. So. Thank you. Thank you. Here. To make a, a comment? A I don't think this is oh. either on, so oh. can you hear me? Come more close. Okay. Yes, um, much better. As, as a biologist, and when you're talking about rootedness versus wholeness, I was thinking, well, a root starts as a single um, trajectory, but then, of course, it becomes um, diverse and actually uh, becomes even larger than the crown. And I think that's a, in some ways, um, that kind of encompasses what to me, a lot of your poems, which are beautiful, and thank you so much, uh, were saying to me. I just wanted to say that. It's hard to ask this questions about poems. This is daunting. It's a yeah. somewhat set of theoretical concepts we've been talking about, so I can imagine it would be a little daunting. Yes, please. I have a pretty, pretty big voice, so I'll try from here. Can everyone hear? Mm -hmm. Good. Um, I'm intrigued by vitrification, glass, mirror, windows. Almost each one of you have some reference to one of those glass vitrification. Maybe you could talk a little bit about that, how, how that happened to you and you could explain it to you. For me, I mean, <laughs> the, <laughs> the image of glass or uh, vitrification has something to do with the impossibility of being totally in the world. Like something is resisting, you can see everything, you can almost touch everything, but there is kind of uh, borders that you cannot totally cross. So I would say this is why this image uh, comes, actually it comes very often in my poetry, not that much in the texts I read today, but in my other texts, it's almost everywhere. <laughs> so that's, that's a nice question because, yeah, it's really something important for me. 
In the metaphor of China, so not exactly glass, but um, it, I, I forget how I stumbled onto it, although it just feels like one of those gifts um, from the universe. Um, but it, what made it really um, powerful to work with for me is, is the idea that it's both fragile and strong. You can, you can have one, you know, something glass or, or vitrified material like, like China um, for hundreds of years, or you can one false move and it's, and it's gone. And, and that kind of um, uh, tension is, is something that drew me to it in, in that poem. Yeah, to me, yeah, I agree on the image of, specifically of the glass. And to me, it's also very much connected with the precision we're talking about, it, with the clarity of vision, you know, the precise word. Few words, but very precise, like kind of like uh, the kind of light that you get, for example, with this weather, so sharp, you know, with the snow. Yes, it, I'm cold, I'm, I'm <laughs> insisting that. No, but it is very important to do. Um, I come from the country, but now we're all experiencing traumatic things, uh, politics-wise, where, you know, there's a lot of talking, a lot of talking, and it's always like, and then, oh, no, you didn't understand me, I meant something else. Like, no, words should be precise. If you are a writer, you have responsibility, therefore, right? You, and that, even more if you're a politician. So I want precision, clarity, few words, but just, you know, with wait. I wish I had something to add, but I'm <laughs> unaware of this image in my work. So I'm sitting here and I listen to what they've said and I think that sounds brilliant. <laughs> yeah. But these are also all images of a fearsome kind of strength, yes. right? Um, I'm, I'm a little bit afraid to drink from that teacup. Uh, <laughs> yeah. Yeah. And um, those honed weapons and, it, uh, a, a, and a militant kind of clarity that I do think has something to do with the fact that we have four women poets at, at this moment writing um, poems that, that want to be balanced on a knife edge. <laughs> Uh, and don't want to be doctrinaire, uh, and don't want to oversimplify. Thank you very much. Uh, as, as you say, Elisa, the public discourse is so full of both mush and simplification that there is a, a great rigor um, that, that you all seem to be striving for, both by giving us heroines of rigor mm -hmm. and images of, um, uh, of, of, that have the sharpness of Boston weather. Those of us, <laughs> we embrace it. Are there, yes, please. Thank you so much for your readings. It's such a pleasure to listen to you read and to hear your voices um, embody the works that you've written. Um, my question is actually about listening, because I always think that the difference between artists like you and someone like me, who is not an artist, is that you have a secret about how to listen. And I wonder if you could talk, this is a far less erudite question, it's, just, it's a craft question. Um, I wonder if you could talk about what you listen to to find your poetry. <clears throat> Thank you. I, would, I can start. Thank you for that question. I think it's actually quite erudite. I think it's a complex one sound to try to parse and why you follow the language you follow as a poet. I trust my ear and I trust the ear that, that actually speaks, that hears what we speak or any sounds in the world, as well as the ear that's in my mind. So I think of those as two different ways that I write poems. Um, and, um, but yes, I mentioned the last poem that I was, Marta had told me she was a singer once as I was and I think that that's why when I'm writing poems, I'm also really attentive to silence too. Um, not just the words, but how much silence there has to be for those words to carry the kind of power and weight that they need to carry. And so all of that is my response that when I'm listening, I'm trying for, to hear all the different possible silences as well as sounds, yeah. 
Go ahead. Okay. Yeah, so th thank you for this question because uh, I would say my way to connect to the world is mostly by ear. So I listen everything everywhere all the time, every sound, every voice. Uh, and uh, I love languages and listen to different languages. And uh, I try to focus on sounds like, for example, sounds of the nature, like in my poems, but also, for example, I enjoy so much the, the subway sound in Paris, for example. It's extremely interesting. Yeah, Marta can tell. It's very, lots of harmonics, many interesting things. And I listen a lot uh, music, lots of kinds of music, and it's really feeding me every day to write. So classical music, but also jazz and rock and even pop music and and yeah and and I totally agree with what you were saying about silence. It not often you can listen to the silence. It's very rare, but in some places you have the chance to the chance to hear sometimes almost silence. Impossible. Almost, yeah, and it helps also a lot to find uh, the how to settle a word mm -hmm. into the void or yeah, the void or the emptiness of the page. Mm -hmm. I uh, I would add to the things that we listen to or that I listen to that inform my poetry. Um, so all of those things, but also commercials and, yeah. you know, <laughs> just, I mean, the most degraded language um, <laughs> can become interesting when you find a way to bring it into a different context. Mm -hmm. So that's, that's one thing. And I also think, I mean, you also kind of asked about how to listen. And I don't know if you were here last night, but one of the poets who's not present but is also participating in Marta's project uh, Soma Sharif, she has a poem that, that played um, in which she has these lines, that, I'm not sad, I'm not sad. And why I, I'm bringing them up to say that sometimes what you have to listen for is the information in the tone, even if it's cutting against the information, the semantic information of the words. And, to just use your, your own emotional intelligence when you're listening. I absolutely share all their uh, visions. I want to try to answer with a short poem, Please. if I may. Uh, this is, comes from the Paul Selen section, so it has one uh, line by him. We speak darkness that sticks to breath. We speak glass that makes holes in paper. Listen with your mouth. Look in the mirror with your ear. Hmm. <laughs> it's dangerous. Um, also, thank you. This is an incredible pleasure. I am recalling from the question of how do you listen? Oh, hi. Um, I'm recalling a snippet that I heard when the poet Elizabeth Alexander was being interviewed by Krista Tippett, who's a radio host. And she was, Elizabeth Alexander was telling over the story of um, the rehearsal for her reading a poem at Barack Obama's inauguration. But that was the next day. That day, she like, was just practicing and like, popped off a poem that she knew very deeply by Gwendolyn Brooks about onion frying in the kitchen and a set of things. You know Kitchenette it. Kitchenette building. Mm -hmm. Yes. And Elizabeth Alexander described that she's just, you know, sharing this poem of, that had become something she knew so well. And at the end of it, she realized that the random people on the mall had all stopped and listened mm. and were clapping. <laughs> and so my question for you is, has there been an incredibly powerful moment where you have read poetry? <laughs> <laughs> That's a good question. That's one. And the mic was on. 
It was that kind of rehearsal. Yeah. inaugural poems often. <laughs> um, there's, it's hard to answer that question. I mean, I actually really love reciting poems to people that I've memorized other people's poems. So for me, there's a really great pleasure in doing that. And one that's coming to mind, of course, is Elizabeth's. Um, so I would say as much as anything, I get great, great satisfaction and joy out of sharing poetry as yeah, um, probably though in terms of a sort of transformative reading for me, I would have to cite the first time I read in Jamaica and a very unusual series of events occurred in which I reconnected with my father's family after not having known them for 20 years. So that poetry could do that uh, was phenomenal in my life, but I don't know if that's about the reading or it's about just the coincidences of time. Um, if I may. Mm -hmm. um, mine wasn't actually reading. I do also installation projects with my, my poems. And this <coughs> one, I've asked a bunch of people to tell me about themselves through an object, and I've wrote it, the poem, on a pillowcase, and then I hang the pillowcase outside the windows. Mm. So people during this small festival were given a little map, so they walk around this area of Florence, look up and read the poem. It will be very nice because they didn't know me. So I could just walk around and listen to her just saying, and I, that was great because the people, you know, saying, oh, I like it. I, it's poetry, you usually don't like poetry, but this I like it, you know, and kind of like surprised. So that was very nice because it wasn't the usual crowd of people that came for your book or such and such. It was completely unexpected. People went to get their, you know, bread, whatever, and so walked the dog and was like, oh, there's a poem up there, you know, and that was very nice and to, to hide, you know, and, and listen to that. Um, yeah, that you set a really high bar with your um, <laughs> your <laughs> anecdote. <laughs> um, so, n so nothing like that. But yeah, you know, I think I feel like I have a lot of powerful moments with poetry mm -hmm. being shared. Um, that's kind of a through line in a in a low bar sense. Um, one that comes to mind from recent memory. This is actually another Paris story. Um, I read at the American University there, and there's a poem I wrote, I think, most immediately in the aftermath of the Orlando uh, Pulse shooting, um, but that drew upon a visit to um, a detention center in X, out, just outside of X and brought that all the way through um, a kind of global look at places that become, their, where their very names become sort of um, metonyms for violence, particular violent acts. And I've gotten emotional reading before, but it was the most I think um, present, mo the most clear moment when I thought, I think everyone in the room was just in that same space. And that kind of um, collective experience mm -hmm. is one of the things that I think poetry is great at, so. For me, I would say, like, to connect with what you were saying, uh, it was also after uh, t the terrorist attacks in Paris, and uh, I was really like feeling very bad. And when I'm feeling bad, I just recite myself poems. I know <laughs> lots of poems, uh, and I just yeah think about texts. And I thought, okay, I will have to go teach tomorrow. And what can I do with my students to mm -hmm. discuss what happened and to comfort them in a way? And I said, OK, what I would do is to uh, read poetry. So I search in my, in, on all my books uh, authors that I would think could help my students. And I choose poems. And I made a uh, handout of 
maybe 10 poems that I found very strong. And then in the class, we discussed what happened and we read these poems. And it was just so strong and so intense to share this. And many of the students were crying. And they told me then that it helped a lot mm. because, yeah, there were poems speaking about violence and political violence and all these kind of themes. So I think this was the most intense moment I had with poetry. Um, so let, let me take the, the opportunity to first to, to thank everybody. I'm going to ask one more question, one last question. Uh, but but uh, afterwards, there is a sort of modest reception where um, we can continue our conversations. So I'd like to everybody to, to linger and, and speak individually with, it, with our um, with our guests. Um, the question I have is a follow-up on, on the question that was just asked, and it's about your experience of performing your poetry. So you write poetry in, presumably in some sort of isolated space, a personal space, mm -hmm. and you imagine a reader, you, you imagine your connection to, to other people is through reading. This is the <coughs> most primal form. And then there might be something in between that and the, the kind of experience which was just mentioned where you might be performing you know, in a formal setting, then kind of setting where you're reciting, but it's not necessarily a formal setting, but, but people happen to, to be there. And then maybe some of you have had also the experience of reciting on radio and how the differences in sort of the, your connection, direct connection to audiences mm -hmm. shapes your reading of poetry. How you, how you perform, or whether you find yourself looking at the audience and then reading the same poem in a different way just by looking at the, the people who are there. I, I'm the designated beginner. <laughs> I, I start answering the questions. Um, yeah, I think that's a great question, and thank you for having us here. Um, I don't write poems with anybody in mind. So I do write them by myself. I write them to the dead often, or to the poem. That's who I kind of think about when I'm writing. I suppose if I'm thinking about anything other than syntax. Um, so that's the truth. Um, but then when I'm in front of people, and as I am right now, I love people. And <laughs> I love to look at people and see them and try to have a connection. So that's what I try to do then when I read the poem. I try to find the people I'm reading to to connect. But your question really makes me think about last night, uh, more so than radio. I've done that as well. And then you think it's a disembodied um, sort of person you're trying to find, right? Um, but Marta, you know, what I helped me a lot was Marta was our director. We had rehearsals. This was very exciting for me, because I don't usually get rehearsals as a poet. And we had our director, our composer, who said something I thought was exceedingly helpful, which was, to project outward. And so I think that maybe is the truest thing I could say that cuts across this. When I'm writing the poem, I'm projecting inward. But then when I am giving a reading or a performance, to de varying degrees, what I'm doing is projecting outward. So thank you, Marta, also for that, because it helps to answer this great question. I have a, may I jump in? So I now produce television shows on poetry. And um, I'm fascinated by what a resonant space the 24 minutes that used to hold situation comedies or the news, um, what a very resonant space 24 minutes is for a poem. The tacky, the resonance and the tackiness um, does not come from the delivery outward <laughs> from a poet to an audience. And I'm, I think about that a lot. I think about this form and format, which is an ancient one. We deliver, the poet stands at the center and delivers mm -hmm. of her, herself. And I, I confess that I, am ambivalent about that form, that format, especially with this. 
and this Separation. and this, sorry, Radcliffe, seems like get gift horse in the mouth. But, but is we have grown very, very accustomed to thinking what we should do with a poem is look at the poet and watch the poet read it. I, for the larger understanding of poetry, I, I'm glad that there's TV. I can't believe I'm saying that, but, uh, and, and radio. And I think we're learning from, from how we're all addicted to podcasts, how we want to live just in our, in our ears. The collect, this collective experience has an importance we don't, we don't want to give up, but for, um, I don't know, there's something, there's something about TV that to me is like chamber music. You know, it's like a, a, a very small recital hall that, um, that works really well for poetry, where I, I try, to, try to make it work. But I'm, and it's so different than the internal looking mm -hmm. and the giving. Evie and I have, have filmed together for television, so we'll see, we'll see what happens. Yeah. That the, 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 the evidence, the outcome is still yet to be, yet to be seen. Um, it, it's so funny. I, I hear and, and resonate with what both of you have said, but I guess um, since I've been called, I'll just say that I, uh, I'm very much thinking about audience when I write. I, I'm writing to you all. Um, there are the you all that I know and the you all that I know will get all of my references and then the you all that I'm wondering, okay, are they gonna go to Google for this? <laughs> uh, how can I make them want to Google it? Mm -hmm. uh, you know, I'm, I'm very much wondering mm -hmm. what somebody's gonna do with it. Um, it's very much, and I say that as someone who doesn't, even though I read a lot of I poems, you know, I am from the South and so forth, um, that's not always, the mode that I'm writing in, um, but I, I love to think about audience, and and I do think that um, maybe the the takeaway for me is that all of these different ways, you can't get a poem in a bad way. Um, mm -hmm. Tracy K. Smith, our, our current poet laureate, has a podcast now where she's doing like five minutes. It's called a slowdown. Five minutes, one poem, and her little introduction of it. And it, every day it just downloads and you can just listen and it's got jazz in the background. And it's, <laughs> it's just this like escape from the world. Mm -hmm. the, the kind of shows that El Elisa puts on are like these gatherings and, and layers and, and, and sort of webs, I was saying this earlier, webs of of reaction to a single poem. This space where we are live, I, I love to watch theater, and so I'm very much into the energy. I, I give you all from myself and take, I draw on you. If you sit there and are quiet and don't say Southern trees, it matters. <laughs> it affects the, the reading. So, uh, so yeah, just all of those. Uh, thank you for just raising that as a question. Yeah, great question. I think it depends also because at times, for example, for the Emily Dickinson, I had her in mind. So I was physically writing these things thinking, okay, then I'll leave it at this point on her bed and let's see what she was gonna think about it. <laughs> uh, and so the same thing with Ceylon in this case was this dialogue with, with him and then obviously they embody, you know, mm. the other. That's the such an important poem. point so. that po poets are talking to their predecessors. Yeah. They're talking to the yeah. language yeah. that came before yeah. them. Exactly, yeah. and they they go back through that language, right? And they yeah. become the other. So it's the once again everybody and and the, the nobody that we know she said mm -hmm. she was. So um, it kind of shifts and moves. And so once again, it's the fragment that needs to be mm -hmm. re recomposed. I would say that I, I don't write for the audience, but as I write by ear, I pronounce the text, even if I'm alone in my room, and yeah. even more if I'm alone in my room. I, pro <laughs> I pronounce the text with loud voice and to try to experience 
what uh, you will experience. And what I love is then to be surprised by the reactions of, of the audience. Yeah. Yeah, Thank you all. I think we're supposed to drink wine now. Is there wine? <laughs> <laughs>